my name is Dermot Bulger. I'm a novelist, a poet, a playwright. Uh, I'm a prematurely bald man. Uh, I am speaking to you from my uh, home in my living room in Duncondra. I wish I was in Limerick, but my spirit is in Limerick. I'm delighted to be taking part in the Limerick Festival uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, where I choose to write is is very often where the words find me because you write different things. I mean, novels can be ground out on cold Tuesday afternoons as a matter of routine, whereas poems mug you. So in lockdown in the past year, I primarily written poems, and uh, you you write poems when your mind is the great things written poems are boredom and drift. Uh, and basically, I find that walking the streets of Dublin at 11, 11 o'clock at night when your mind is empty, that a sudden thought sparks with electricity. And you just know that's the opening line of a poem. And you also know that unless you write it down immediately, it will be gone. I used to have a very, very impatient wire haired terrier called Jack. He was my best critic because uh, I always got my poems on him when I was walking Jack. And Jack hated poetry. He used to, he, he would he would chew poetry books if he could. And so I, I would be found in Nuncondra. Because always, you never bring paper with you as a writer. You always have a, a Tesco receipt or a docket and a pen somewhere. So you are frantically trying to lean against the wall write the opening three or four lines of a poem while a, a dog is pulling out of you. It made the poems very short. He was a very good editor, Jack. But that's poetry. And poetry, Yeats said that out of the quarrel with other people, we make rhetoric. Out of the quarrel with ourselves, we make poetry. And those are those very personal... I remember like doing a read with Roddy Doyle in Vienna, and he read a novel and I read poems. And afterwards he says, I finally figured out, Budger, you're just too lazy to buy a camera because it was it was like almost these like moments of home movies that where the poems were. Whereas a novel or a play, uh, you're talking about 18 months, two years of your life. And very often you will write them in remote and strange places. I wrote two novels uh, in the Bailey Lighthouse in Holt, which is, as, as you're flying in over Dublin, very often you'll see this lighthouse flashing on and off. And that, that isn't to warn shipping. That was me trying to find the light switch on the way out. Uh, and I found those wonderful. I, I also written some novels in an old um, seminary, in, in the attics of an old seminary, which was wonderful and creepy. Uh, and I wrote my last play, in uh, a play called Last Autos for the Dockside in a 15th century Renaissance Italian castle somewhere in Italy that you got on a green bus at Rome Airport and four hours later it dropped you in a town and a man picked you up. And I was there for a month uh, until somebody paid the ransom. Uh, it was the uh, Chief Italia Ranieri Foundation I'd never heard of who, who gave me this room. And that was wonderful, but mostly, but particularly in in lockdown and as I got older, uh, I just find that my sitting room is generally very, very fine for the purpose. And I'm here in solitary confinement with around five different sparrows who come. I have a little, around uh, two inches away here, I've got the window, I have a little window box and uh, I feed the birds every morning and they come and peck on the window if I don't. So they're like my wire terrier, they're very impatient. Uh, and so you actually try and create um, a structure on your day and I always think that writing a, any long walk of fiction or drama, it's like opening an imaginary bed and breakfast in your mind. And you go into this imaginary place for X amount of hours every day. Now, if you're a full-time writer, you do it for eight hours a day. If you're somebody who's writing their first novel, you just cart off an hour every evening. And it's, as I say, it's like an imaginary bed and breakfast. And if it's open every day of the year, then the phantoms of your imagination may very well come in, wipe their feet and uh, book into that, that, that hotel. And then you begin to write about them. So it, it's actually the, the place becomes less important than the routine. But sometimes when the kids were younger, you needed somewhere that was uh, just away from everything. Very often the place where you'll write will be totally different from the place the novel is set. When say, with last orders at the dockside, uh, it was set down the docks in Dublin. It was set on the night Johnny Logan won the Eurovision Song Contest, and the docks are on their last legs. The is a pub that's closing down. The actual um, there are very few dockers left. That whole community seems to be just been devastated. Uh, it's very hard to imagine it now as you walk through Dublin. 
Docklands. Uh, and uh, so when one had to um, close the windows of my 18th, 15th century Renaissance castle and actually bring myself down, down to those docks. And sometimes, so when you're writing, you're in two places at once. In this room here, I wrote one of my favorite novels, which is called um, The Lonely Sea in Sky. And it was about my father, was on those small Irish ships that sailed to Lisbon during the war to bring back vital national supplies and were bombed sometimes with equal neutrality by both the Germans and the British. Uh, and uh, actually, I asked him before he died, what was the last uh, national supply, vital supply he brought back? And he said it was uh, sheets of cork for making stoppers for Guinness bottles and um, um, also wine. So everybody has their own version of what constitutes a national uh, uh, supply. But to write that book, I actually had, uh, my son is six foot seven, so I had his bicycle here beside me because it was stolen from the shed. So I got, I, I got a new bike and it was a map of Lisbon in 1941 there. And there was a map of Lisbon now on this wall because I knew Lisbon now. And so you were actually in this room and you were in Lisbon in 19. 19- 41 and you're walking those streets and so there's a duality in writing you actually have to physically be in one place to actually write and you have to mentally be in another place to actually imagine yourself into these unfamiliar strange streets or this strange period and it's getting that balance right it, it, it's finding a way to um, immerse yourself totally in a world that's totally different from the world you're writing in In two places at once. It's the last months, 12 months have been very, very strange. Um, in that I was doing an awful lot of gigs and I, 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 and COVID still happened. I remember on the last year was a leap year and on the 29th of February, I was with John Sheen in Wexford town and everybody quite rightly loves John Sheen. And so the entire audience were hugging John Sheen. And then because they, I was with them, they were hugging me. Um, everybody was pausing for photographs and it was all incredibly relaxed and then a week later I was interviewing um, Christine Dwyer Hickey in Blessington and had all got very serious and there was a small crowd there and we didn't know whether to actually shake hands or, or to you know uh, bang elbows or anything else and the whole it was grand but it was just different and then Three days later, I was giving a talk in Pierce College uh, in Crumlin, uh, adult education. I do it every year for people going back to education. And I was outside the college and uh, the Taoiseach, who was then Labour Radka, was announcing on the radio that schools were closing. And through the windows, I could see uh, people stacking desks in Pierce College to close. And I went in and I said, listen, we can just call it off. And they said, no, no, no. We just, people are here, so we do it. But it was literally, I, I think I did the last reading in the last school in the last hour before when these things were feasible. And then suddenly there was nothing. And uh, I, in my first short story was published by David Marcus when I was a schoolboy in fifth year in school in, in um, Eleven College in Phoenix. I remember going and getting the Irish Press newspaper and being so incredibly excited. Uh, at seeing my words in print there. And, and that's a thrill that um, a, a writer still feels, no matter how many books you publish. But I always wondered, would I ever publish a collection of short stories? And things get in the way, uh, as in like 15 novels, 17 plays, uh, playing football till I was 50, uh, never getting any better at it. Uh, and so I use this period of lockdown. Sammy Khan, the American songwriter was once asked what came first, the music or the lyrics? And he said, the phone call. And so with me, short stories were trying to come with a phone call. So over the years, I would get a phone call from BBC Radio 4, from RTE, or from Faber and Faber, or somebody doing an anthology, or somebody wanting to commission a story. So almost all my short stories were uh, commissioned by the BBC. Uh, most of them were, or by, or by someone like that. And they'd be very, very tightly restricted in terms of word count. It's got to be 15 minutes long. It's got to be like 2,300 words, all these things. So you would actually let these characters uh, who maybe you had in your mind. I, I remember the first story in the book is called The, the Last Person. And uh, the gist came to me in a flat in, uh, in Kilbourne in around 1987. But I, I didn't write it until around four years ago. I, I, I never had 
someone to fit the idea of, of the story. Uh, and then the BBC phone you and say, oh, that's the perfect thing. But then you wind up like um, writing the story and the characters begin to talk to you and they tell you their life story. And you wind up with a first draft of around 7,000 words. And then you realise that you never get to write the second draft because you begin to edit that those 7,000 words down into 2,300 words or 3,000, or whatever the deadline is for the story. So you wind up that the stories that are broadcast, the stories that are published are truncated versions of the phantoms of your imagination. So in this lockdown, I said, I'm so used to doing things that I would go mad if I do nothing. So I actually took all of my short stories, all the ones I liked, the best 11 of them. Uh, and this time, I wrote, I rewrote them, but I didn't write them for the BBC or for RTE. I wrote them for myself and I let them just take on life to their own. And if they became three times the length, they became three times the length and they didn't, they didn't. And so it was actually, I suppose, um, I had written three novels in the last five years. I've had a few plays on the last few years. So there was nothing on that was um, like a, a massive deadline weighing on my shoulders and so it was actually for the first time in years I was just writing for my own pleasure and so uh, the book which became um, Secrets Never Told which is probably the best book of short stories you've never read uh, is um, it, it's just my gift to myself it, it, it was these stories these little mini fictions told in the way the characters wanted me to tell them and parallel with that, I began for the first time in 10 years to write poems. Because again, I think those streets very, very quiet at night and walking along and the emptiness of the landscape and the emptiness of things happening and the emptiness of your imagination, it just brings those thoughts to the fore. And again, it was a bit like the stories that things that came to me that might be poems five, six, seven years ago that I had sort of dismissed suddenly came back to me with a new freshness and uh, I began to write them down. And and so it's been, for the past year, I've really just been writing for myself, which I, I suppose writers should anyway, but, 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 but very often you're writing because somebody wants a play, somebody wants a radio play, somebody wants an article. And this, in some ways, these, the book of short stories, Secrets Never Told, and the book of poems I'm gonna publish next year will just be little gifts to myself and hopefully people will like them as well. I suppose one thing that's changed about my reading is that I live opposite the public library, which is very, very handy. Uh, a, a writer should live near an airport and um, near a public library. Uh, and uh, But the, the public library is closed. So um, I, 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 this is one room, this is all the books in this room are history books. And then all the books in the next room are editions of my novels in different languages. And uh, Graham McLaren, who's the um, artistic di director of the Abbey, came, came to visit me a couple of years ago and he looked at the two rooms puzzled and, and he said, ah, he says, in and out. This is this is the system of books. But then all the other all the other rooms are full of books that people send me. And so books arrive in the post. And you keep meaning to read books and and and, and you never do. So I, I found that say during lockdown, and it's the same way as when I was um, a, a young man, I had no taste for whiskey. Uh, yeah, I, I drank Guinness, and, and now, you know, in, in, in my more mature years, I'm I'm discovering that like, you know, a 12-year-old Irish uh, whiskey is actually a very pleasant companion. You're never quite alone with uh, a small Irish. And um, in the same way, n books that I bought 25 years ago, maybe editions of Graham Greene's novels that I always meant to read, that I never got around to reading. Uh, I'm rereading those books and I'm rereading uh, Ulysses and Dubliners again. And I'm, I'm rereading sort of Francis Stewart again. And I'm rereading sort of what always... Jennifer Johnson, who is my very great friend, uh, who's probably the first book I read, the first adult sort of book I read, would have been The Captains and the Kings by Jennifer Johnson. And she's in a nursing home now, and I can't visit her, and uh, I miss her. And, and it's lovely. And, you know, a number of writers I've known have passed away. And so it's been, you know, reading their books again uh, brings them back to me. And uh, so I, I find that you're locked in this little bubble uh, and you actually have to go in in the same way as you have to delve into your inner resources your inner strengths uh, you also have to delve into into your inner library and um, 
I'm finding books that uh, I'm, I've no idea where, where they came from. They're a bit like pens, you know, the, I've never actually bought a pen, but I've never had less than 10 pens at any one time. You know? So uh, I can't remember when I last bought a book, but there seems to be like an awful lot of them around the house. So uh, I'm reading all kinds of, and, and I'm, I'm reading new writers as well and, and getting great pleasure from that. When I write poems, I write longhand, mainly because I can't bring my laptop with me on, on walks because uh, balancing a laptop on a dog would just be a, a little bit too too uh, difficult for, for, for me. So uh, I, I write the first draft of my poems by longhand. And actually, firstly, I did that because I, I was out in, in the street, often the lashings of rain, uh, struggling to find a pen and a bit of paper. But also I found that when I came back home, I will continue writing in longhand because once you began, this with poetry, once you began to put it on, on the page to type it up, you become very preoccupied with the shape and the structure and the line length and the paragraph breaks and all those sort of things, which are like the road signs to for a poem, for a reader. And so uh, I, I found that it was better to simply just um, keep going in this barely legible scrawl of my own without getting too preoccupied by how the words actually worked or how the lines function. So uh, as a poet, I would write in longhand. As a novelist, I wouldn't write in longhand because I, I can't, I can barely read my writing when they're short poems. And uh, so I find that um, I, I sit and I, I write for hours, but I, I, you don't, I think every novel I've written, I have abandoned around seven or eight times. Uh, and uh, in, in the old days when, it, when it, you were typing, it was great because you could actually just take up the manuscript and throw it against the wall uh, and walk away. With, with laptops, this is a very dangerous dangerous strategy. So you, you, you have to be more patient. So you can actually, you can't kick the laptop, but you can kick the table the laptops on. But that's normal uh, in the sense that, that you're... Your imagination will just come to a halt. You'll come to obstacles. So what I've learned to do is, um, when I'm writing a novel, I, I, I do a little bit of irresponsible writing. It sounds a bit strange, but what I mean is that I, there was a story that um, somebody met Patrick Kavanagh when he was writing Tabby Flynn in McDade's. He, he, he was in Mac, McDade's pub and they said, how's the novel going, buddy? And he said, it's going great. Tabby's out in the field. He's sucking on a straw. He's looking up at the clouds. He's thinking of girls, which is what he does primarily for the whole of Tabby Flynn. Uh, and then they met Kavanagh three weeks later and they said, how's the novel going, Paddy? And uh, he says, I can't get that fecker out of that field. Uh, and so that's the problem with linear writing as to what happens next. So uh, I find that sometimes you get bogged down in the mechanics of the plot and the characters... Um, uh, they get stymied by this. So in some ways, I, I, I would take two characters from my novel. I'd put them in, in a hotel bedroom or on a train or somewhere. They're totally they're disconnected from the plot of the book, from the mechanical plot of what's happening. But they're allowed to speak to each other from the heart about what they really want to say to each other or what's really troubling them or what dark secret they have or something. And so this frees up all those mechanics of the plot of, of what actually works. And so I wind up like writing like six, 7,000 words of this other thing. I'm not idea how that links in with the first part of the book. And, uh, but it allows me the freedom to actually sort of, um, to get to the core, to the essence of what they want, want to say. And when that begins to get bogged down in the mechanics of the plot, I put them somewhere else. So basically, around a month before one of my novels is finished, if I died, nobody could put it together. Because it's it's like the bits, the engine of a Ford Fiesta on, on the garage floor and all these bits and pieces. And so and then you begin to amalgamate them together. When you work with uh, film people, it's quite fascinating to see how film people work and how they actually... Uh, they when they, when I've written the film script, when or some writer has written the film script for them eight thousand uh, times, and they have it exactly right. They write every 
seen down on a card and they put all the cards against the wall of the hotel bedroom. That's why film directors always have suites, just, just so the cards will fit along the wall. And then they walk along and they say, well, it, we have seen A, scene B, scene C. If we went from scene A to scene C, would the, would the audience just automatically get what happens in scene B? And they pull out all these things. And so you, from watching filmmakers, um, playwrights, everything else, you learn so much about the different ways to tell stories. And so you begin to find those shortcuts that will take out the mechanics of the plot, but will leave the emotional heart of the characters. I suppose I was lucky with COVID in that I had, um, I mean, it's hard to me, but my four months before COVID began, I was had a solo play in the Abbey and there was 445 people in there every night happily sitting together, which is something that's hard to imagine now. And because it was set down to docks, sometimes there were whole dock, dockers communities in and they were drinking till two o'clock in the morning in the bar of happily 10, 10 abreast of the bar. And it was wonderful. And I had a couple of novels published. So I had nothing big coming out. I mean, I've this little book of short stories coming out, but I, I feel so sorry for a first time writer who's maybe spent like 10 years of her life or 10 years of his life walking on a book and dreaming of a book and dreaming of that launch. And there's a great validation in a launch where all your family and your friends come together and they haven't, I mean, like books have actually sold reasonably well during the pandemic, but that whole thing of, uh, celebrating a book and launching a book hasn't been there and you know going going out on tour and 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 this event in Limerick would normally be happening in Limerick and I'd be meeting yourself and I'd be meeting all the other writers and everything else and, and that and meeting readers which is very very important and so I, one thing I do miss I miss meeting people who read my books uh both of them and uh I actually sort of um it's so but, but, but I'm very, very fortunate in that I've, I've written a number of, you know, quite, quite a lot of novels and so it doesn't affect me. Publishing, I think publishing will be changed by it and publishing is changing. And so the world of publishing that I knew in London, say, you know, 25 years ago was gone and the world where like, someone like Peter Strauss and who was the editor in Picador could like pick any book he liked that was under £25,000 for an advance and just simply uh, buy it without asking anybody. Uh, and now everything is is through committees and everything is true. And, and so you don't need, it's not so much an editor now, you need an advocate. You need somebody who actually passionately falls in love with your book and who fights for your book at all those endless meetings in publishing houses and, and in conglomerates, which, which a lot of UK publishing houses are. And so that sort of um, random chance, I mean, Carlo Gabler is quite funny in the sense that he, um, he had a friend who knew a friend who was a writer who didn't make much money, but who, who made money on the side by uh, painting and decorating. And he actually, uh, yeah, he, he, and uh, he painted Carlo's friend's flat. And Carlo had given his friend Carlo's novel. Carlo had given his friend his novel to read, his unpublished novel. And the guy who was painting and decorating the flat uh, was bored at lunchtime on his break and read the opening 50 pages of Carlo's novel and found his publisher and said, listen, I think there's a really good guy here. You should actually come over and meet him. And so Carlo uh, wound up getting a publisher um, through a painter and decorator without having met the publisher. And, and those sort of random things don't happen anymore. It's more streamlined, it's more structured. Uh, and um, but, but I think, you know, new, comp new publishing companies come along and you know, Raven Arts, which I ran, came out of the whole punk impulse of uh, you know, band starting, um, filmmaker starting, um, publishers starting. And I think that, that that sort of punk impulse has never quite gone away and there'll always be new presses starting up which, sort of, uh, which are open to innovation and ideas. I think of all the art forms I'm involved in, I, I, I think like, uh, COVID hasn't changed poetry much and hasn't changed uh, novels much in the sense that bookshops may be closed, but people can still access novels and, and particularly with eBooks and everything else. The one thing that the big change is, is in theater. And that's a great tragedy. And I, mean, I say, I was so fortunate in having 
quite a number of large productions, uh, of three large productions in three years in the Abbey, and, and having the benefit. Of, and, I, and then there were, uh, I think they were in the middle of, of um, rehearsing uh, a Brian Friel play, Faith, Faith Healer, when uh, the, the thing broke. And suddenly, and you had all this program of so many new plays by so many new writers that have just got into limbo and I've no idea would they, would they ever come back or what will happen with them or how theatre will function again and that's a great tragedy you know for me there were uh, there was a small tour of one of my plays to America and there were small productions here and there but they, they, they weren't they weren't they weren't important um but that's the great uh dilemma facing theatre of, of, of how do you invent something that is so dependent upon and say you can have streamed plays and access and Bally Munn did a version of a play of mine called Bang Bang with uh, Pat McGrath and it was wonderful that was really really good and it was, it was quite interesting because it's a funny play and a tragic play it's about a Dublin street character and in some ways um Listening to it with a live audience was wonderful because the live audience laughed so much and they brought it alive. But listening to it without the audience, the tragedy really, really came true. But with that said, it wasn't live theatre. And what's fascinating about I mean, I say in the next room, I have like books and translation, and it, they're great. I, I wish there were more of them, but they don't cause me a particular thrill or a particular fear when a book comes out in French or German or something. But every time a play is done, whether it's a play, a professional production or a little uh, amateur production in, in uh, a, a town hall, if I'm there, I'm terrified. Because just because it works on a Monday doesn't mean that it won't work on a Tuesday. I, I remember my um, I did a version of Ulysses, a stage adaptation that was done in by the Tron in Glasgow when they brought it to China and everything else. And then the Abbey did it a couple of years ago. And I didn't know it was work because it, it didn't have the normal dynamics of a play. Um, and it was been played in the round in the Abbey. We configured the whole theatre. And the I said, if Act 1 goes, okay, then I'm okay. But I want to be 20 minutes into Act 2 before I'd, I'd be able to relax. And at exactly 20 minutes into Act Two in the Abbey, you could hear a pin drop. It was absolute stillness. And I knew that audience were totally immersed in that play. And then from the back row of the sort of, because we're in the round, so behind the stage, suddenly a former world midway boxing champion stood up cradling what looked like the dead body of an old man in his hands. And the old man was a, a great actor, Daniel Reardon, who just passed out. And, and the boxer was his son-in-law. And because there was no way out, apart from crossing the stage, he had to come down the steps and walk across through the actors, who many of whom knew Daniel, who was a wonderful man. Uh, and the audience not knowing was this live or not live and the actors had stopped and frozen and then the actors resumed and then somebody appeared uh, from backstage and said is there a doctor in the house and suddenly like three doctors came running down through the abbey one with the stethoscope already in, in in her ears at the side door and then because it was being played around it didn't have the usual emphasis and exit. So as we we're waiting, like Daniel Reardon was fine and he was a great guy. And he, he gave an interview on the Joe Duff show the next day and, and uh, taught, uh, plugged every play he was in for the next 12 months, like a good season pro that he was. But because he was lying in the doorway, waiting for the ambulance to come, the actors who were coming on and off stage had to step over him. And were saying, geez, Daniel, how are you doing? I can't talk to you because I've got to be in this play. And there were 440 people there none of them had the slightest interest in my play anymore. They just wanted the play to end so they could figure out who this man was. Oh, in the middle of it, Sebastian Barry also ran across his age because he recognised Daniel once he was the other guy. So this is a very extreme example. But every time you go to a play, anything can happen. And people can pass out. An actor can forget their lines. Live, live theatre has a tension between the audience and the actors. And when the actors come on, if they get that forced laugh, they relax. And then the audience sense that relaxation, the audience relax. And if they don't get that forced laugh, they get tense. And then the, act, the audience feel that tension. And so all these things happen. And there's a special, there's something very, very special about being in a crowd, whether it's 50 people or 500 people, 
watching something collectively and watching something at home, even though it's the exact same thing, uh, if you're watching on a computer, it just isn't the same thing because it doesn't have that extra dynamic. And I think theatre is the most precious of all the art forms that I'm involved with. Precious, I, I don't mean in any, I mean in, I mean in a sense of it is so unique and so special because a book can go on forever, whereas a play only exists for the duration of that run. And it is been so many people dependent upon it and actors, playwrights, but also all the people who walk backstage and all the unseen roles who are now wondering have their future, have their career, and are highly skilled, highly dedicated. And so that's something that I'll be watching the next 12 months. I don't know the answers to this, but I, I hope that theatre finds a way to reinvent itself. And I hope that live theatre com comes back because it is something, uh, it will be the ultimate tragedy if we lost it. I'm going to read um, a story from my uh, new collection, my debut collection. It's great to be um, 61 and three quarters and making my debut in something. Uh, my, uh, my my friend John Sheen was in his uh, late seventies when he published his debut collection of poems. So I'm not I'm not that old really. Uh, it's called Secrets Never Told, and this story is called The Last Person, and it's about uh, the strange twists and turns in a writer's life. I hope you enjoy it. The last person. Jack had been too nervous to enjoy his previous four book launches. Twenty years ago, the first was overshadowed by his publicist's anxiety about Jack talking too fast, which made him speak more slowly than a state funeral commentator. He remembered little about his second launch beyond how, at the meal, the chief executive at his publishers had assured Jack he would become huge in America. After his third book launch, he and his new bride, Ellen, had slipped away to a Soho coffee bar with his agent to celebrate the film deal broker that afternoon. Skipping any fancy dinner, they happily shared an oven pizza in his agent's house while watching midweek football highlights. The agent's infant son had sneaked downstairs to sit on Ellen's knee, and Ellen had smiled, imagining when their own firstborn might nestle in her lap. He hadn't discussed business with his agent that night. There was no need. When the film got made, his future would be secure. It might have been too, if the film had happened, or if another publisher hadn't swallowed up the US imprint due to release his novel, or if his own editor hadn't been told to clear his desk one Friday afternoon with a severance check to follow. Jack remembered his fourth book launch because of how people were merely fulfilling contractual obligations. The speech was made by a minor executive, and when it ended, the publicist never thought to call a minicab for Jack and Ellen. This was the nature of publishing. You arrived with hype and went home by tube. His new publicist was trying to make a virtue out of the lean decade after that first novel, when Jack had scraped a living by teaching creative writing workshops. Jack was out of sight for so long, she enthused, that he was like a man of mystery breaking his silence. That silence had almost broken him. Three additional novels rejected before he turned to a brilliant plot he had spent 20 years shying away from. With his fluency, he had written this new novel in three months. Early reviews were now calling it his best novel since his debut, packing an energy missing in his other books with that paled by comparison. This unanticipated success made him no longer feel like a failure to his children. Not that they or Ellen ever complained when the money had dried up. His fellow writers always treated him with respect, and so many were here at this reception, genuinely pleased for him that he felt moved. He had never bemoaned his fate or felt envy towards successful contemporaries. He was surprised by how many well-wishers were here too, readers who seemed pleased that his long wait was over. They made it sound as if during the years when he thought he'd never see his work in print again, they had kept him afloat in their hats. Hopefully, there will be other book launches, but tonight he wanted to savour this acclamation that nobody here could begrudge him. Uh, at least so Jack thought, until a slightly dishevelled figure entered the bookshop. At first, Jack barely noticed him browsing the shelves, seemingly oblivious to the launch, but increasingly, Jack's eyes returned to him, 
because there was no mistaking his identity. Two decades had aged Killian, but as he toned, Jack knew he would only have a T-shirt on beneath his coat. It was all Killian ever wore, no matter how cold the weather. Killian retained such good, rugged looks that Jack suspected older, rich women, women still fell in love with him. They first met when Jack was living in Sheffield, gathering only rejection slips. Back then, Jack haunted bookshops, trying to unobtrusively examine literary magazines. Too poor to buy them, but anxious to get the postal address to send off unsolicited manuscripts. Three months of waiting would follow before the crushing disappointment of having his story returned, with Jack trying to gleam solace from any comment an editor might add to the rejection slip, desperate to find encouragement to continue. Editors seem to suggest that Jack was no genius, but he had talent. He would never be great, but with hard work, he might become good. Killian was his polar opposite. From the start, Jack knew that Killian was great. He just hadn't known if Killian possessed a work ethic to ever become good. Killian was from a small Irish village, which he quickly outgrew and wound up studying at Sheffield University. But like everything he started, Killian let university slide, not finding it challenging enough. Therefore, like Jack, who was equally broke, he spent his days in Walkley Library because it was centrally heated. Both wished to be writers, but when they adjourned to the Greasy Spoon Cafe that became their meeting place, Killian's intelligence terrified Jack. Killian could dogmatically dismiss every mediocre, trite story in the small magazines they discussed, able to quote passages memorized after one reading. Such recall was a mark of genius, and Killian was marked out as a genius. While Jack struggled to start his first novel, Killian was halfway through his ninth one. Killian's problem, but he was still also a halfway through the other eight. Having brilliant ideas was no problem for Killian. His problem was boredom. Midway through writing a novel, he'd figure out the ending and lose interest, too preoccupied with his next brilliant idea. This was the problem with being a genius. The grind involved in finishing stories seemed beneath Killian. But now, watching the shabby figure in the bookshop, Jack knew that Killian's problem was never too much genius. It was a pathological terror of being found out. From the moment they met, Jack had accepted that Killian was destined for greatness. He had invented such a reputation to live up to that if he ever actually published a book, no matter how brilliant, he could never match the expectations in his head. Watching Killian approach, Jack desperately wanted someone to intervene and save him from this encounter. Killian picked up Jack's new book and scanned a paragraph with his old quizzical look of appraisal. He nodded as if he had read enough and stepped forward. It flows well, Killian said. You always had that facility to let a good story unfold. It was typical of Killian to launch into conversation as if continuing an existing chat. If Killian had made Jack uneasy by appearing at Jack's debut launch, he felt far more unsettled now. Jack's early success had petered out, but at least he had briefly been somebody. Killian remained a fossilized genius, uncontaminated by success or failure. Strangers glanced over, wondering if Killian was an eccentric famous writer or professor. Even in his frayed clothes, he possessed a distinguished commanding air. I tried to let the story tell itself, Jack replied guardedly. Oh, that's wise, Killian nodded as if instructing a novice. The story is already formed in your subconscious. You just need to be half diligent clerk and half medium. How are you? Jack asked. I'm walking on different things, Killian said. I sent an idea to a libretto to Europe's only half decent composer, but I don't know if it reached him. When I phone, I get blocked by minions. Are you writing fiction? Killian shrugged wearily. It's all about finding the right editors to send it to somebody you respect. The critics are worse, all morons. He paused. But I write about your new book for once they recognised originality. This was said with such warmth that Jack wondered if the barb was only in his own conscience. From the start, Killian was uncharacteristically kind about Jack's work. 
urging him to ignore rejection slips, making him believe he had a future in writing, not as great as Killian's, but as a truly great second-rate writer. Killian had been kind in other ways too. When Jack's money ran out, Killian, though normally secretive about his private life, had offered Jack his own tiny bedsit in the final days before Jack left Sheffield to return to live with his parents. It was a box room of a red brick house where Killian had not paid rent for weeks, as became obvious when the furious landlord appeared. Other tenants also made it clear that Killian was barred from the communal kitchen where food had been stolen. Not that Jack knew any of this when Killian gave him the spare key and disappeared to stay with his older lover. Use anything you want in the room, Killian said. It's no use to me. I'm throwing everything out. This remark puzzled Jack when he got there. Apart from two t-shirts and a pair of jeans, the room was bare, making Jack realise how penniless Killian was. The only other item was a suitcase. Jack had opened it and sat up all night, reading the opening pages of nine discarded novels, some bizarre, some blackly funny, but two of them breathtaking with extraordinary plot lines and entangled relationships. Every manuscript was unfinished, Killian having lost patience or courage. But if Jack ever conceived of one idea this good, he would toil doggedly to mine his potential. Use anything you want. No use to me. I'm throwing it all out. These words haunt him during the ten months when Jack lived with his parents, writing to Killian twice but getting no reply. They remained with him when a sympathetic publisher returned Jack's first novel, saying that while well written, it lacks spark, but to stay in touch with the right debut, it might make for a good second novel. It wasn't deliberate plagiarism when he began reworking one of Killian's abandoned novels. It was an exercise, an attempt to conjure a different voice. It wasn't plagiarism because soon the characters took off in directions Killian could never have taken them. Killian would never risk such possibilities of failure. When sending it out, Jack had planned to call it a novel inspired by Killian's work or even co-written with Killian. But a fortnight later, the editor replied, recommending an agent to protect Jack's interest because he had been offered a three-book deal. Raising the issue down would have scuppered his career. Jack had diligently, although nervously, tried to locate Killian in Sheffield, but found no trace until Killian appeared, just like now, at Jack's first book launch. He hadn't surfaced at the launch of the other novels that were entirely Jack's own work, novels critics had politely welcomed while awaiting Jack's next great work. It was hard to decide how much of Killian's abandoned manuscript lay at the core of his fifth novel and how much Jack had concocted when resisting the urge to write this book until in despair he began it as an exercise, a way to conjure a new vice, not anticipating this late success. The reviews captured its essence, Killian said no. There was no criticism in his tone, no accusation. The judgment lay in Killian's presence this unspoken way of letting Jack know that without Killian, he would not be here surrounded by admirers. Jack looked around his party, which suddenly felt fraudulent. Killian followed his gaze. Are they your wife and kids? Yes, they must be proud. I hope the book sells well. With kids, you need money. That's why I never had any. Too much responsibility. I travel light. Listen, Killian, Jack said. I can't get your name on the cover, but I've royalties due. I'm more than happy to help you out. What help do I need? Killian asked. You mind your wife and kids. You owe me nothing. Is there anything I can do for you? Jack looked at the book in Killian's hand. Can I at least give you a copy? Killian patted his shoulders. I'll buy one, he replied. I've bought them all. I have rejoiced in your success. You've worked hard. Now enjoy it. Well, let me at least sign the book for you. Jack immediately regretted his words. He knew the reply already. The reply Killian had given him at his debut book launch 20 years ago. Now you're grand, Killian said, about to disappear tonight. When I get home, I can sign it for myself. <laughs>